Good evening and welcome to a special edition of London tonight from here on the River Thames. We are here tonight because nearly 10 years ago a little boy's torso was washed up on the banks of this river. He was named by police as Adam. Their investigation into Adam's murder has taken thousands of hours of work and has cost millions of pounds. It has taken detectives from the Metropolitan Police all over the world, but his identity has eluded them until now. Our correspondent Ron K. Phillips and her cameraman Mike Field have tracked down the one person who can answer the biggest question of all, who was Adam? Their film that you are about to see does include a photograph of the boy's body which some viewers may find distressing. On the 21st of September 2001, a man was walking home from work along the River Thames. As he glanced into the water, he spotted what he thought was a barrel floating towards him. But to his horror and disbelief, he realized it was in fact a human body. I got called as being on call for, for South London that day and, and presumed it was just a normal killing. It was, might have been a, it might have even been an accident. We often find bodies floating in the Thames which are then, you know, hit by boats, etc. So I have very distinct injuries. Um, but as soon as I saw, I got called here, saw the child's body um, and it was a uh, small torso of a young black boy, we knew we were dealing with something different. After serving 30 years in the Met Police murder squad, Detective Chief Inspector Will O'Reilly thought he'd seen it all, but the sight that met him that day still haunts him. The police had pulled a tiny boy's torso out of the Thames. As this distressing picture shows, he had no head, no arms and no legs. The only clothes, a pair of bright orange shorts. I got a call from the police to say could I come in and be involved in the investigation and they showed me the, the photos of the torso in uh, minute detail and I could see from that just how careful and close the cuts were for instance, um, how the body had been drained of blood um, and at that point theories began to emerge uh, in my mind and it certainly rang some warning bells for me. The autopsy revealed the child had been killed by a cut to the throat and the limbs had been removed with skillful precision. But weeks went by and no one came forward to report a child missing. How could a little boy just disappear? Normally on a murder inquiry, once you find out the identity of the victim, the, the rest normally follow suit like a pack of, pack of cards, really. For detectives, the boy's identity was crucial. The investigation team were under pressure to produce results, but they had almost nothing to go on. Good afternoon, everyone. On the 21st of September, the body of a child was recovered from the River Thames. Now, we've not identified the child, and consequently, we've taken the unprecedented step of giving him a name. It's Adam. Until his family is identified, we will act as his family and his community will be the community of London. But to some within the investigation team, the anonymity of young Adam and the way he was killed gave them a theory about the motive behind his murder. Having lived in Africa for a number of years and travelled there extensively, I knew that there were different types of killing that take place, both of animals and occasionally, very rarely, of humans. But in a particular kind of killing, namely sacrifice, it's about draining out the blood. The purpose of the whole killing is the blood, and the cuts that are made in that case are usually very careful. The process that's followed in the killing is very intricate. And everything that I began to study on the Adam case began to point in that direction. We started to consider the ritualistic motive really after the first post-mortem when the pathologist suggest, suggested that the, the way the, the child had died um, pointed to some form of ritualism had been involved. And it moved on from there after we found the potion of concoction inside the child's body. Scientists examined the contents of Adam's stomach and found unusual substances, including obscure plant extracts and flecks of gold. 
the contents of Adam's stomach, both the, the, the main intestine and lower intestine, did point towards him being prepared. Certain things were found there that seemed to have suggested that he was being prepared by um, some deviant priest um, in the community that was getting him ready for sacrifice. Detectives were dealing with the first ever known case of child human sacrifice in Britain. It shocked them. Why would anyone do this? They needed to understand the reasons behind the murder. It's about power. It's about transfer, transfer of power and responsibility. So that if you need something done, you can perform a ritual and that will create, generate the power. So if you make an offering to a god or gods, the power is then released for you to be able to go ahead and, and get whatever it is you want. The main obstacle that faced police was not knowing who Adam was and where he came from. All they had was a body and a pair of orange shorts, which so far were their biggest clue. The only sort of traceable evidence we had on the body was a pair of orange shorts. Um, and we made a lot of media appeals in those early days in the inquiry. And a, a viewer did phone in and say that they, she'd bought similar articles of clothing with the same label from Woolworths in Germany. Except for the news that the shorts were bought from this particular store, detectives were drawing a blank. The police forensic science unit was set an unprecedented task to try to build a scientific portrait of Adam in order to establish who he was and where he was from. We wanted to find out where in the world the child was from, because clearly a black child can come from anywhere in the world. Um, but using some of the groundbreaking work that was happening in science at the time, both from DNA and by examining the contents of, of his stomach and his, and his intestines, we were able to narrow down that he came from only a very small area in the world. That's the area around Benin City in Nigeria, and has spent a very limited time in, in Europe. The only unit specialising in ritual sacrifice in the world was in South Africa, and so that's where detectives focused their investigation. They offered a reward for any information, and Nelson Mandela was so shocked by Adam's murder, he made a plea to the African people. If anywhere, even in the remotest village of our continent, there is a family missing a son of that age, who might have disappeared around that time, 21st September 2001. Please contact the police in London. I wish to repeat my appeal to all people across the world, and specifically in Africa, to come forward and help her bring to justice the killers of this young boy. Unfortunately for the investigation team, the appeal provided no lead and they left South Africa no nearer to identifying Adam. The continued silence back home and the forensic evidence proving Adam had only been in Europe a matter of weeks led police to believe the boy must have been trafficked illegally into Britain, specifically for human sacrifice. We're fairly confident he was trafficked into the UK illegally. Uh, a lot of inquiries were made around the time to try and identify him. Huge searches of passport registers and flight manifests and even um, shipping. They checked shipping lines from Germany through to the UK and no trace of uh, a young African boy could be found that couldn't be identified. So the belief is that he was trafficked illegally into the UK. What everyone wants to say is that this was a one-off, uh, that there's, there's been no repeat. Um, either in this country or indeed of children being sent back for any bad purpose. The reality, unfortunately, is different. And without wanting to be sensationalist, I think we need to wake up to the fact that it has been going on. Children have been trafficked, not always for this end, but certainly for some horrendous um, results. Um, and we've got, to be, we've got to wake up to this and sort it. Detectives had alerted immigration to be on the lookout and in July 2002 they received the breakthrough they were hoping for. A Nigerian woman called Joyce Osiagede had been arrested in Glasgow. She would claimed asylum in the UK having previously lived in Germany. We searched her flat in Scotland and we found clothing uh, from the same company, indeed of the same size, as worn by the child we now know as Adam. 
Um, that was very significant for us. There's a lot of clothes here, and they're obviously your children's clothes. Where were they bought, most of those? I bought most of some from Germany, and uh, this, this one's at second hand. This one is from my relative. Nick? Yeah. So I'll be back in a sec, Jobson. Same company. Different size. Those clothes there, do you remember the shop that you bought them from? Woolworths. Woolworths. Joyce denied ever having contact with Adam and stressed she had no involvement in his murder. She said the clothing found in her flat belonged to her daughters and DNA results proved that she was not Adam's blood relative. When detectives discovered she was in Hamburg at the time of Adam's death, she was released and deported back to Nigeria. For six years, the police got no nearer to identifying Adam or his murderer. The trail had gone cold. Then, in 2010, detectives received a call from Nigerian police saying they'd spoken to Joyce and her brother Victor. She's finally agreed that she had custody of her little boy um, and that she dressed him in shorts, um, which belonged to her daughter. And she agrees that the orange shorts um, that the torso is wearing are exactly the same shorts that she dressed the little boy in. So we're fairly confident the little boy we have, Adam, is the boy that was in Joyce's custody in 2001. This was a major breakthrough for the police. They were desperate to speak to Joyce. Her brother says she's prepared to tell us the whole story. Um, and the reason that she's held things back is she's in fear of the people that have actually committed the murder. Her brother told detectives he and Joyce would meet them in Lagos to be interviewed. And when DI Andy Craig and DS Stuart Reeves went to Nigeria in May 2010, welcome, I accompanied them. Welcome. Okay, okay, you are welcome. Okay. Hello. Nice I hope you had a nice flight. When Joyce's brother arrives at Lagos Police Station, he tells detectives that Joyce is not with him and is instead in the neighboring city of Benin. But he says she is still willing to talk to them. So Joyce is your sister, yeah? My junior sister, baby Adam was in her custody in Germany. The baby was given to her, to her by their parents. Parents of Adam, is that? Mm. What, what parents? That is Adam's parents. The parents were deported from Germany to Nigeria. So what did she do with the baby? Did, what did she say? She she the kept baby. the baby. OK. She kept. Baby Adam, yeah? With her two, two daughters, they were together. The baby with her two daughters were all together in Germany. Victor mentions a new name to detectives, a man called Bauer. Could he be the link police are looking for? So Mawa took the baby yeah. from Germany mm -hmm. to London. Mm -hmm. In two months later, she joined them in London. She says only to hear from Mawa that uh, the baby Adam uh, is dead. I did not warn her if she opened up to police, then they will kill her and kill the two, two daughters. Victor's statement was compelling evidence for police and a major breakthrough in the case. Detectives already had statements from a social worker and a caretaker confirming Joyce had been looking after a young boy just before Adam was murdered. But they still didn't know his name or exactly who he was. In order to establish this, they needed to speak to Joyce. Victor promised to bring her to the police station the next day. Twenty-four hours later, Victor arrives back in Lagos. He's managed to find his sister and this time has brought her with him. Police hope that they'll finally discover the true identity of the boy Adam. But to Andy and Stuart's frustration, they're told by Nigerian police that Joyce has had a breakdown and is too Deal ill to be interviewed. Uh, yeah, we need her to get some medical care, don't you think? It's a huge blow for detectives. And so, unable to speak to her until she's recovered, they have to return to the UK.
So if we get the information we require, we will continue with it and make further inquiries and hopefully be able to identify ultimately who, who committed what is one of London's most gruesome murders. Child murders are very, um, very rare in this country. This is the only unsolved child murder in London in 30 years. Um, so, you know, it becomes personal, just, not just to me, but the police in general really want to solve this one. If the boy we have come to know as Adam can be identified, it could be the key to the case. Earlier this month, I returned to Nigeria. I'd managed to obtain a photograph of Joyce where she can be seen in the company of a young boy. Could this be Adam? Is this the face of the boy whose identity has eluded detectives for nearly a decade? Can Joyce provide his real name? I wanted to speak to her and hopefully get some answers. Meet my sister, uh, Joyce. Joyce. Uh, Miss, uh, oh, when I eventually meet Joyce, she appears confused and unsure of herself. This may be due to the medication she's taking. But after repeated questioning, she finally tells me that when she lived in Germany, she looked after a young boy as a favor to a friend, but then gave him to a man she calls Bauer. So the baby that you gave to Bauer, what was the name of that baby? Momosa baby, Adam, they also call him, his native name is Momosa. Is this the baby you looked after? Is yes. this the baby that you gave to Bauer? Yes. Then mm. this is the boy you looked after for a short time as well? In Germany for one year. I now travel with my two children to Britain to seek refugee there. So after, after that, I, when I get to Britain, I now found Bauer. Uh, where is the Bomosa? Then he said he's dead. Well, you say you, you didn't have anything to do with the killing? No. You know, I'm a mother. I have children. I can't kill somebody, child. <clears throat> do you know who killed Ikpamosa? Ikpamosa? Yes. No, I don't know the group of people. They, you know, they use him for ritual in the water. But uh, I gave Ibomosa to Bawa. Listen carefully, please. I gave Ibomosa to Bawa. And when I got to Scotland, Britain, he said Ibomosa is dead. How old was the boy that you looked after? Six years. And how was he as a boy? What kind of boy was he? He's a lively boy. He's a very nice boy. And he's, a very, he's also intelligent. Are you willing to talk to the police now? Yes, if they come. And are you willing to tell, you would tell the police that this is the boy that you handed over to Bauer? Yes, if the police came. Let me just be clear now that this little boy could well be the boy yes. whose torso was taken out of the Thames. Yes. Finally, a name and a face for the boy we've called Adam for nearly 10 years. A positive identification by the one woman who cared for him. That name is Ikpamosa. But will it prove to be the key the police have been looking for to enable them to solve this brutal murder? It's a major breakthrough to, to get a, a name um, and a photograph really of, of a victim. Um, without a name, murders are very, very difficult to solve because you've got no starting point really. So th this is a crucial starting point for us. Um, if it's correct, we could identify the family of the child and, and I would think it should lead to identifying who killed him.